going to be starting in 1st uh, Timothy. So if you have your Bibles, your tablet, your phone, we're just going to be starting in the book of 1st Timothy. So um, I've been kind of stewing on this for quite some time now. I've been wanting to do a series. And um, I'm going to read the, the passage of Scripture, and then I'm going to kind of give you a, a, an overview of where we're kind of going in the direction of these next uh, 13 weeks. So if we're in 1st Timothy chapter 1, we're going to be reading the first three verses. 1st Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace, from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So, uh, this verse in verse 3, where Paul is charging Timothy, we're going to find these words, no other doctrine. Uh, I've been working on a study... And I think that there's a need uh, for it in the sense that I think there is a lot of misunderstanding of God's Word today. There's a lot of confusion around what God is doing today and what God's done in time past. And there's these blurry lines of, okay, well, I know Christ died for my sins, was buried and rose again the third day. What am I supposed to do about that? So um, what we're going to kind of find is uh, an overview. I'm planning on doing an overview of all of Paul's epistles. It's 13 epistles that he wrote. How do you know that Paul wrote them? His name is the first word you'll find in every single one of his epistles. That's unique. I, I find that interesting. Of the 66 books of your Bible, these 13 books start with his name. And the words, I, I want to kind of, before we jump in, there's a couple of things that we're going to talk about today. Number one, we're going to talk about, we're going to define doctrine. Why did, then we're going to talk about why did Paul charge Timothy with this certain command. We're going to talk about the teacher of the Gentiles and what we need to give attendance to, and we're going to see it's going to be doctrine. So first off, we need to define what the word is doctrine. That word, you pull up an 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary. It's like the English Bible for the English language. It defines doctrine... Uh, it's to teach. It's just, it's just to teach, teachings. And uh, the word doctrine, you'll find that word, I like kind of looking at all these things when I'm doing my studies, 56 times in your Bible you will find the word doctrine. Okay? Of those 56 times, 33 you'll find them in the books of Genesis all the way to Acts, Hebrews through Revelation, 23 times you'll find it in Paul's epistles. These are just kind of interesting facts, and these will all tie in. But who is doctrine for? This is what we need to discuss. Let's go to, hold, hold, keep your place here in 1 Timothy. We're going to go to Isaiah. So hang a left. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. Verse 9. Whom shall we teach knowledge? And whom shall we make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and are drawn from the breasts. So, doctrine is what we're reading right here. Who, do you, who, who understands doctrine? It's not for babes. Doctrine is not for babes. I have, uh, Grace isn't in here. She's two years old. For the first year, she lived off of milk. She needed that. If, you're, if, you're, if you've been saved and you've trusted in, in Christ and in the gospel of Christ, Christ dying for your sins, being buried and rose again the third day, you trusting in that for your salvation, you now have been made alive. The Bible says you've been quickened with Christ. Now you need to get the milk of the Word for some point in time. You need to understand the Word of God. And there's, there's a time where you're just kind of learning the basics, milk. But then there's a time where we need to grow up 
put childish things behind us, and now how should we walk as an adult? Now, Paul talks about this with the Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Get my watch out here so I can see what we're doing on time. All right, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to be reading the first three verses. Paul speaking, writing to the church at Corinth, he tells them, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, and neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, and ye are not carnal, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So again, we're seeing Paul talking about these Corinthians. They trusted, they received the gospel of Christ. You can go and you can read about the Corinthians in the book of Acts and what their status was. But there is much divisions and contentions amongst them. What were they fighting about? They were fighting about doctrine. They were fighting about doctrine. So let's just turn back uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll show you. Uh, we're going to jump in at verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Why is He telling them, you guys need to speak the same thing? We'll just keep reading. It's going to answer it right there in the verse. And that there be no divisions among you, and that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now as this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And he goes on and thanks God that he baptized none of them and explains Christ didn't send them to baptize what the point I'm wanting to make here is that the Corinthians were babes in Christ. There was divisions and contentions. And what were they fighting over? Doctrine. And I'm not going to kind of go into those unique doctrines of what Paul, Paul, Cephas, and Christ said in verse 12. But I think it's fair enough for me to say I can look at the church at Corinth and look at the world today in Christianity. Do you think there's divisions and contentions? among Christians today. Look how many denominations there are within Christianity. More than you can count. I, I did it, that was a couple years back when I looked at the numbers. It was easily in the thousands. Crazy how many divisions there are. And it's all over doctrine. It's all over ordinances, right? What do we know about ordinances? We've talked about this before. There were certain ordinances given to Paul in the book of Acts. He was supposed to keep them in his early ministry. But we get to Paul's later epistles, and I just want to show one verse. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. And we'll start in verse 10. Colossians 2, verse 10. And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised Him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Pay attention to this next verse. Blotting out the handwriting, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, 
which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. This verse right here in your Bible completely destroys any type of ordinances that people are trying to put on their congregations today to keep. There should be no divisions and contentions among us right there and there be over ordinances. Why? Because God took all of the law, all of those ordinances, and you can read about it, abstaining from fornication, abstaining from certain meats, things strangled in blood. All of those laws that were given were nailed to Jesus on the cross. And what did Paul say in that verse? What, what did he describe, those ordinances and laws? That was against us, which was contrary to us. Meaning, the law was to bring us unto Christ. It was a school teacher. It was supposed to help us understand and give us the knowledge of sin. But then there's a point where you need to realize Christ fulfilled that law for you. You can't be a good person. You can't live a righteous life. It's the Word of God that works through you to help you live and act and have your being today. So, doctrine. We've defined it. It's just teachings. Why did Paul command Timothy that they should teach, some should teach no other doctrine? Let's go to back to 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, we're going to pick up where we left off in verse 3. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. Now the commandment then the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. So Paul's telling Timothy, look, Timothy, you need to charge who are these some? These are people that were fellowshipping with Paul and Timothy. Some of them were teaching something other than what Paul was teaching. And what were they teaching? They were teaching, in verse, it tells you, they've turned aside unto vain jangling. Vain jangling, what that means? It's just empty disputing. Fighting over things that are really add nothing to your bottom line. And boy, you can see that all over. Just, if you're on Facebook, look at it, all right? Just, just look at it. Take a look at it. People are fighting over things. And I'm not, this doesn't even have to be scriptural. I'm not even going to the politics. People are fighting over things, and it's just emptiness. It's vain. And, and Paul describes also what, what these guys are wanting to do in verse 7. They're desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor of where they firm. Meaning... These guys are preaching things that are in the Bible, scriptures. They don't know what it means. And then they're trying to affirm this to all the people that they're teaching that this is what we need to do. It's blind leading the blind. That's kind of what's happening there. And Paul's telling Timothy, you need to charge these guys. Stop. Stop. You should not teach any other doctrine. What's Paul talking about? He's talking about that doctrine that you find in his 13 epistles. Where's the law? Where are, they trying, where, where are they getting the law from? They're getting it from those 39 books in your Old Testament. They're getting it from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're getting it from the book of Acts. Well, it's not really a book of doctrine, but you get what I'm saying. They're, getting, they're taking all these things of the law and now teaching it to people, telling them that all right, this was the law of God. You need to keep it. But what does Paul say about the law? Let's go to Galatians. Let's go to Galatians. So hang a left. A couple books. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. And we'll start 
inverse. Mm, we're going to start in verse 10. For as many are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. So anyone that's trying to do the law for their salvation or in their walk, the Bible just tells us, and right there in Galatians, that they're under a curse. That's a strong word. But, and what we also just read, is that Christ became that curse for us out at Calvary. Paul also talks about to us, we're not under the law, we're under the grace. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, hang a left. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Paul tells us, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? For ye are not under the law, you're under what? You're under grace. Now, does that mean, oh, you're under grace, we can just do whatever it is that we want? No, but that's what people want to try and say if you try and stand up and preach the gospel of grace of God. No. I was talking with someone the other day. If we were at war, and you're with a fellow brother in arms, and, and uh, you're taking enemy fire, and your, your fellow brother jumps in the line of sight for you, takes a shot, he dies right in your arms, and his last words are, you know, live for me. Go on. That same thing applies with what Christ did for your soul at Calvary. If you just look at Calvary and what Christ went for you, piercing his hands and his feet, being spit on, mocked, completely innocent, being stripped naked, beaten with a, a, a cat of nine tails, to the point where you wouldn't be able to even recognize him as a man. Isaiah said they was marred beyond the vision of a man. They plucked his beard from his face. And then they gave him a sinner's death crucifying him to a cross where he hung on that cross for six hours and died of suffocation. He prayed three times, Lord, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. He humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Why? Because he loved you. He loved you. But God didn't leave him in the grave. He raised him from the dead. And it, that analogy with the soldier, live for me, you wanna, you'd want to live a life to honor that soldier, right? If, if that were the case. Same thing applies with our, our soul and salvation. Think about what Christ did for us. Well, wouldn't we want to live a life that's honor and pleasing to God? There's countless times you can find in Paul's epistles where he talks about this. It's your reasonable service is what the Bible says. So, there are people out there that are teaching this right here. You need to keep this. And we just read that that thing, anyone that's trying to do it is cursed. And man, I was one of those dudes. I was just like those Galatians. I was bewitched. Why? Because I was listening to this doctrine that was being taught to me. I went in and every, out of every single denomination. I was told that I need to keep this. I need to keep that. I need to be baptized here. I need to do this thing. All of these requirements. And then I was told, uh, you need to figure out how to share your testimony. In, in one minute, share your testimony. Well, I was a drug addict. 
Man, I, I, I was an alcoholic drug addict. I couldn't keep my life together. I'd share this thing. Hey, and now I believed. And then people would be like, okay, that's great for you, but how does that affect me? No one taught me how to share the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's what saves people. It's His testimony, not mine. And then I was told, oh, you need to find where your, your passions, uh, what you're good at and your world's greatest need. Alex, you're good at playing guitar, um, and we need this. So you need to just play and sing your guitar. And that's what I did. For seven years of my life, I literally did that. And I could barely even make ends meet. I was making, barely, I was making quarter time, not even part time. And then I'd be singing these songs... And then I'd be studying and reading. I'm saying, wait, something's not lining up here. Why are we saying that we're saved by grace, but then if we don't do these things, we're going to be shep- separated from the sheep and the goats? This isn't adding up. Oh, you're saved by grace, but there was always something else. And it wasn't jiving. It was so frustrating. But I was listening to these some that were teaching the law to me that I need to keep this thing. And what was it doing? I was cursed. I was bewitched. I was trying to do all those things in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. You know, last week I, said, I made the comment, I was messed up. Man, I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I was messed up. Why was, and then I should have explained, why was I messed up? I took the Bible, literally, word for word, as you should. You just need to rightly divide it. But anyways, no one told me that part to rightly divide. So when I got to Matthew... And it says, if your hand causes you to sin, what should you do? Cut it off. I'm not going to... I literally was at that point saying, oh my gosh, this is going to hurt. Thank God, I I was too wussy to do it. You You know what I did? I just jumped in the Tennessee River in the middle of winter, thinking that if I get baptized again, maybe that'll wash away the, the, the guilty conscience that I have before God. But then I'd read, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. All of these things that you can read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What are they? They're the law. How do I know that it's the law? I'm going to show you that that it is in the law in the Scriptures. Go to Galatians. Galatians. Chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made, what are the next three words? Under the law. To redeem them. Who's them? Israel. That were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So, Jesus Christ, when we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those four gospel accounts of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry, that verse lets us know he was on the law. When John the Baptist came and, and bap- was, was, Jesus was coming in the baptized, what did Jesus Say, remember that? John the Baptist is like, no, I should be baptizing you. But Christ said, no, so the righteousness might be filled. He came to fulfill the righteousness of the law. He came to fulfill those 613 commandments that you can read in Leviticus and of uh, Moses, and he fulfilled it. And what does Paul explain? He explains that Christ took those things and nail them to the cross for you and I, that no man could live or keep, and became that curse for us. Hallelujah. Thank God. I mean, we hit the jackpot in the time frame that we lived, that we're living today. So, charging Timothy that some should not teach people to do no other doctrine. There's three different doctrines in your Bible, okay? You've got the doctrine of Christ in His earthly ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are same things that you're going to have to kind of go and look at. I don't have the time to dive into. Then you've got the doctrine that was committed to the Apostle Paul. That doctrine that Christ gave to the Twelve was for the nation of Israel, God's chosen people for the earth. 
that God is going to eventually come here and establish His throne forever. Kingdom of heaven down on earth. Then you've got the doctrine that was committed to Paul. This is the doctrine for the Gentiles. Remember the last two weeks we did the Gentiles, the apostle of the Gentiles, and Gentiles just means the nations. That's everybody. And if you recall, we went back and I showed you from Adam to Abram, it was just Gentiles. It's just Gentiles. Then God called out Abram. Circumcision was introduced to him, the covenant of circumcision. And then God was going to make that great nation. And you read those 39 books, it's all about the children of Israel. I'm telling you, just read the words where it says, Speak these words unto the children of Israel. You know God is speaking these words through those prophets to the children of Israel. Is anybody here a children of Israel? No, we're all Gentiles. We're all Gentiles. So that doctrine that Paul has is the doctrine, the apostle of the Gentiles for the Gentiles, and it's a heavenly thing. This, these 13 books, Paul says, was a mystery. Let's go to Romans chapter 15, 15, 16. Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. We're going to be jumping in verse 25. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Why was it a mystery? The next words tell you. Which was kept secret since the world began. So Paul's gospel that you'll find in here was kept secret since the world began. Ephesians tells you that it was hidden God. Let's go there. Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And verse, jump in verse 7. Paul's talking about himself. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, Paul, who am less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given that I should preach among who? The Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been what? Hidden God. So there are things in Paul's epistles that you can't find anywhere else in the Scriptures. That's why he talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. You can't find some of these things. What are some of those things? One of those things is the rapture. The great catching up of the church, the body of Christ. The body of Christ was a great mystery. You and I, those who have trusted in Christ for their salvation, that's the, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of mysteries. I don't have time to go into it. But Paul's charging some through Timothy, don't teach the other doctrine. What doctrine is he talking about? No other doctrine than what was given to me, Timothy. I'm handing you the reins, and you need to know that there's going to be some. I'm going to notate that word, some. Five times it appears in 1 Timothy. There's some that are turning unto vain, jangling. There's some that have made shipwreck of their faith. There's some that have turned aside after Satan. There's some professing have erred concerning the faith. Now, that's just interesting. So, that doctrine all ties in with what was committed to Paul. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter um, chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Well, before I, I do that, I want to give a quick overview of, of one. So Paul says, charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Why? There's some that are desiring to be teachers of the law, in verse 7. And through the rest of it, Paul explains what they're trying to teach. Um, and he explains the purpose of the law. 
And he's telling them that they're teaching things that are contrary to sound doctrine. Verse 11, According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So Paul was given a unique ministry. We talked about this last week. He's the only apostle of the Gentiles in your Bible. He's the only one that's ordained to be a preacher and a teacher and an apostle, a teacher of the Gentiles. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Whereunto I, Paul, am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I find it really interesting that Christ, the author of our salvation, the finisher of our faiths, working through the Apostle Paul, had it written that Paul says, I speak the truth in Christ and I lie not. I find that very interesting. Why? Because everybody wants to kind of push Paul aside or they're confused about his, his epistles. Peter even said, as he, even as our beloved brother Paul writes, in all of his epistles are hard to be understood, which them that are unlearned rest. They twist the scriptures. And man, there's a lot of that going on today. But the point being is that he is the one that is the teacher of us today, the Gentiles. He's the teacher of the nations. And jump to, to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. So you see that, those preached unto the Gentiles? Who's the one that preached unto the Gentiles? Paul. Paul was the only one that preached unto the Gentiles. Now, why is this significant? Well, I'd say about the first five, seven years of my religious experience going in and out of the denominations, I don't even remember once hearing a message within those epistles. You know where the majority of my messages were coming from? Everywhere outside. Everywhere outside where I find the grace of God, I was being taught. Timothy, I charge you that you charge those some that they teach no other doctrine. I, I didn't even get to that part. I was reading that on my own, and I'm like, this isn't lining up. If you truly... You, you gotta, you got to see this for yourself. I could tell you about it, but until you read it for yourself and you study it for, your, for yourself, you will see that these things in here are not lining up with the other ones. I have a video. 17 points where Peter and Paul uh, deferred. Now, it says, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're rightly dividing truth from truth. That's all it is. You're separating truth from truth. What is the truth of what God is doing today versus what is the truth that God has done in times past and from the ages to come? Because what's happening right now is God is dealing with the church, the body of Christ. Those are His chosen people today. He's not dealing with the nation. There is no uh, uh, respective persons with God today as there was in times past. But he's forming the church of the body of Christ. And eventually one day, we're going to be filled up complete. And Christ is going to come on the clouds in 1 Thessalonians. He's going to catch up those that are here on the earth and bring those who are asleep in him up in heaven. And we're going to be with the Lord together and we'll be in the air forever. But then, God is going to continue his prophetic program through the nation of Israel. But that's been put at a pause. So, we need to understand the doctrine of grace, age living. What are we supposed to be doing today? What are the things that we need to teach people? How are we supposed to interact with our, our spouses, our children, uh, and as we're servants of our workplaces? And what are we need, what's the message? What's the gospel that we need to be sharing with people? And this message is so simple. It's Christ died for your sins. Christ died for your sins at Calvary. 
He was buried, and God rose on the third day according to the Scriptures. And, in, and by you simply believing on the Lord, trusting that He did it for your sins, that saves you. That's the power of God unto salvation. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. And that's 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. In our booklets, that's why I put that. You first page, you open your booklets. God's will, the gospel that saves, and what do we need to do to come into the knowledge of the truth. So, the last part is giving attendance to reading in the doctrine. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter four, and we're going to be reading verse thirteen. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. You know, I was kind of giving you, um, you know, just kind of facts. You know, fifty-six times. 56 times the Bible mentions doctrine. 33, you find it outside of Paul's epistles. 23, you find it in Paul's epistles. Nine times you find it in this, this book alone, in 1 Timothy. I find that very interesting. I find that very interesting. I think there is something that we need to learn. And if we're not giving attendance to reading and to that doctrine, how are you going to know what you're supposed to do? How are you supposed to live? You know, this is why this is why we we gather weekly, bi-weekly. You know, to to it, it's it's one thing for us to come together and fellowship, and and to to listen. And, and look, I I understand that we're all at different levels. Everybody's coming in from different walks of life. There are people that are in this room that have studied and read this thing over 50 years. You know, there's people that have are kind of getting like we're all at different at different levels. The point being, don't be afraid to ask questions. And I hope even for you who are tuning in line through Facebook, YouTube, and through a podcast, don't be afraid to ask questions. When I was kind of diving into this thing, guess what? I asked every single question that I can. If you're not asking questions for yourself and then searching and doing your own studying, what I would do is I, whenever I was kind of going and listening to other preachers preach, I had a pencil, I have a pen, and I've got a piece of paper, and I've got my Bible. And every single word that they said, I was writing down every single scripture verse. Okay, he quoted this, he quoted that. Or maybe I heard him quote some type of scripture. I would write down those certain words. Then what would I do? I would do what the Acts, I call it the Acts 17.11 approach. Let's go to Acts chapter 17. Hang a left. If it wasn't for this verse, I think I'd be in a very different place today. And I thank God for this verse. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So in Berea, there was a synagogue of the Jews, so you have Berea and you have Thessalonica. The Bereans, the scripture said that these dudes were more noble than those other dudes in Thessalonica. That's what we just read. Why were they more noble? They were ready to receive the words that Paul was preaching, which was the word of Christ. They were ready to receive those words. And then, they, that's what that all readiness of mind is. And then, what would they do? Then they were going back to their homes. They were opening up the scriptures and then they were searching, the, searching what was being taught or preached daily. Man, I can't imagine if, if, if just Christians today took that same mentality right there, what it would look like. Because I, if I'm being honest, I think, and this is just an observation, I think people are taking, and this is, I'm speaking from experience here, okay, because I did this. I did this for seven years. I thought, I thought that any guy that stands up here and opens up a Bible or has a Bible in front of him, that I could just take that thing to the bank. And I did that. And you know what happened to me? Is I was now being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Go to Ephesians chapter 4.
Ephesians chapter 4. Hold that in one hand. And, uh, yeah, we'll read that. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So, what we just read there is, you know, we talked earlier about Who's doctrine for? It's not for babes. It's for those that are ready for me. And here, Paul's telling us basically that we're, we're supposed to grow up. We don't need to be children in the faith anymore. We don't need to be babes in Christ. We need to grow up and, and not be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And Paul, we've re- been talking about this theme. There are some that are teaching, desiring to be teachers of the law, and they're teaching people otherwise than the doctrine of grace for today and what we're supposed to be doing. So, we've talked about doctrine. Why did Paul charge Timothy? The unique office that Paul has and Timothy carrying on that torch and that we need to give attendance to reading into doctrine. So, if I were to summarize 1 Timothy chapter 1, what it's all about? It's all about doctrine. It's all about the importance of doctrine. What do you need to teach your churches? And, you know, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, you know, they're known as like the, the, the pastoral letters. Because really in context, all it is, it's just you're reading a letter from Paul and Timothy. That's the context. And, and Timothy's getting instructions, okay? Paul's getting ready to, to pretty much, he's aged and he's getting ready to, to hand the reins, and and he's basically telling his student, or his son in the faith, these are the things that you need to teach, these are the things you need to tell people to stop, and encouraging him that he's going to now have to endure all these afflictions that come with preaching the gospel. Because, man, you start preaching grace, you start preaching the word, oh, they come. They come in every shape or form, and and nobody's off, um, off limits there. But he tells them to do the work of an evangelist. So it's all about doctrine. I want to close with two passages. uh, Well, just close with this. Let's go to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I was thinking about this message this morning, and I was thinking about babes in Christ, and how I was a babe at one point in time, and how I I was a child of God being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. And, you know, at some point, we need to transition from milk to meat. And I was think I, I couldn't stop thinking about you know Proverbs twenty two verse six train up a child in the way he should go and when he's old he shall not depart from it and I'm thinking about how strong just I've got a I've got a, a daughter and I've got another one on the way um, hopefully within the next two weeks prayers for Lauren please um, and you know I'm watching Grace grow and how she is just a sponge. You know, uh, I think part of it, yeah, you need to train, teach. But the, but the other thing you need to also realize is that how you walk is probably way more important than what you're telling them. So there's the talk, the talk, and the walk, the walk. And I, I, I challenge you today, are you walking the walk? Are you doing what the word, are, not just merely like saying, oh, I... I believe in grace. Well, are you extending grace to others? When, whenever hardships come, whenever there's divisions and, connect, and contentions, and whenever you're di- disputing, are you displaying that same grace that Christ gave for you at the cross? Look, he didn't have to. He didn't have to lay down his life, but he chose to. So if you're in a marital relationship, and, and the husband and the wife, you guys are going at each other, husbands, are you laying down your life just as Christ laid down his life for you? 
And then wives, are you submitting to your husbands? Not, not to the husband, but out of reverence for the Lord. And then children, are you obeying your parents? That's the only thing you've got to worry about. Just one thing, obey your parents. Okay? You guys got off the hook on that one. But, but the point is, if, if you're walking the walk, it's going to be way more powerful that when you start, rather than just simply telling someone, hey, this is, this is how it is. So uh, that's, that's kind of all that I had today. Uh, we're going to sing one more song. And um, so if you guys want to stand up, we're going to sing one more song, and then we'll close in a word of prayer. Uh, we're going to go to page 29. <coughs> also, uh, if, you're, if this is your first time ever, you know, tuning in and you haven't even heard the Word of God. If you haven't placed your trust in Christ, I, I encourage you to do so. Uh, God's will is to have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. God wants you to be saved. And it's, it's very simple. You don't got to say a prayer. You don't got to uh, come down an altar. You don't got to do anything but just simply right there in your heart and in your mind make up, I believe that Christ died for my sins and the cross and that He was buried and then He rose again the third day. And God will save you right there. You won't feel anything, but the Holy Spirit will come and it says you're sealed under the day of redemption. And that sealing, that day of redemption, is when Christ is going to come back on the clouds and take us up to be with the Lord in the air forever. All right, we're going to, on page 29, we're going to be singing, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. So are you weary and troubled, no light in the darkness to see. There's light for a look at the Savior, a life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace through death. Through death into life everlasting, He passed and will follow Him there. Rust in no more at the minion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. His words shall not fail you, He promised. Believe Him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, His perfect salvation to tell. And turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Oh, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face. Oh, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Will you guys close in a word of prayer with me? 
Our Father and our great God and our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. We thank you for the wonderful grace that you've bestowed upon us, those who have believed and trusted in you. Lord, I pray that you would uh, continue to work in and through us in our lives, that uh, we would receive your word, Lord, and with all readiness of mind, and be ready to go search those scriptures and just give attendance to reading and doctrine so that we might know how we're, uh, we're supposed to live and interact with our friends, our family, and our, our, our co-workers. Lord, we love you and we bless you. It's in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here.